another Apollo Papyrus episode. I'm Aaron Apollo Camp. For this episode, the interview guest is a former neonatologist with many years of NICU healthcare experience and the author of the book So Many Babies, which is based on her experience in the neonatal healthcare field. Her name is Susan Landers, and here's my interview of Susan. Dr. Susan Landers, welcome to Apollo Papyrus. Thank you. Appreciate it. Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. I am a retired physician, and I practiced neonatology in the neonatal intensive care unit for 34 years. I retired about six years ago, and I wrote a book about my experiences in the neonatal ICU, I wanted to tell the story of what life in the NICU was like, not only for the babies, but for their parents. So I published my book in 2021. And since then, I have been um, trying to market it. And I have started a Substack newsletter. I have also uh, kept writing my blog, which is on my website. I develop resources for parents. Once a pediatrician, always a pediatrician. So I have kept active in retirement by uh, talking about my book, speaking uh, to groups, nursing groups, physician groups, and um, speaking on podcasts about my experience as a working mother. I enjoy talking about the struggles that I had with a professional career and raising three kids because so many young women these days are having difficulty doing that. Uh, you mentioned you uh, write a Substack newsletter. Uh, what is the name of it and what uh, type of content uh, can be found on a typical post of your newsletter? My Substack newsletter is called Moms Matter. And on a typical weekly post, I write about things that um, working moms are dealing with from my reading in other newsletters, from my talking to um, hosts on podcasts, from my talking with my daughter and daughter-in-law who are millennials trying to make everything work together. I write about topics of interest to working mothers, how to balance things in their lives, how to deal with burnout, how to... the the um, things like the benefits of having a mentor at work, um, how to deal with disappointments as your children face certain problems. So I write about a variety of issues that working mothers face. I think they're sort of this uh, long lost group. They all know about the parenting uh, authors and the parenting experts, and there's so many people who tell them how to be a good parent. But there are not a lot of people talking about and writing about how to make everything jive together. So that is what my newsletter is about. You wrote uh, a memoir called So Many Babies, and without spoiling too much of your memoir, what is it about? Um, I tell stories about my favorite newborns uh, with consent from all of the parents and name changes so the families remain anonymous. There are about 15 stories in my book that illustrate the different facets of having a baby in the neonatal ICU. Some, most of them lived, a few of them died. Many of the parents I got to know and still stay in touch with. Some of the cases illustrate ethical dilemmas 
where there might be conflicts between doctors and parents or between two doctors. Some of the cases uh, illustrate, a few of the cases illustrate the futility of medical technology for extremely premature babies. I wanted those stories to open up that world for parents, especially the parents who had been through an experience in the NICU. So they would know they were not alone and that the trauma they went through, having a sick baby in the hospital for three, four or five, six months was a big deal and that they could connect with other people who would help them kind of make sense of what they had been through. So the book is about all the babies, not every single one of the thousands of babies I took care of over the years, but just favorite illustrative cases. The My memoir is also about my life as a working mother because every physician, even though they're a doctor and takes care of patients, every physician is also a person, a human being. And I was married, still am for 40 years, raised three children. And the question I get asked the most from other women is how in the world did you do it all? Did you manage to raise three kids and have a full-time career? So my stories about my motherhood adventures, sometimes misadventures, illustrate how I did that, how imperfectly and how uh, much of a struggle it was for me off and on through the years. It's really my book, So Many Babies, is really a book for women who have a special place in their heart for babies and who are working mothers who are trying to keep their head above water, be a good mother, be fulfilled in their jobs as well. Is uh, your memoir self-published, traditionally published, or published by, by a hybrid press? It was published uh, with a hybrid press, Morgan James uh, Publishing Company. So I had to put up $5,000 towards the uh, original publication. They do all of the uh, printing and uh, put the books in bookstores and helped me create an online presence, but they did not do marketing of the book. So I had to hire a public relations person to help me with that. And I had to do quite a bit of the marketing on my own. So a hybrid publisher is a good way to get published if you are if you don't have a big social platform. Um, they will help you break in, but they won't do everything that the big publishing houses do for authors. Uh, what was the hardest part of transitioning from your work uh, in the NICU, which is an acronym meaning Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, uh, as a neonatologist to uh, uh, writing a memoir? Well, writing is a whole different talent, I came to believe. My editor pulled my writing out of me. She would take things that I had written that were very uh, precise and punctual and descriptive and she would say I know what you're trying to say but I want you to describe it more so people are, are there at the bedside with you and so I had a great editor who helped me really to learn to write better the end result of my book after working with my editor was so much more professional and um, thought-provoking than it was in the beginning. 
So the transition from being a doctor and writing medical notes or writing peer reviewed articles, many of which I've published in journals throughout the years, I probably published over 30 peer reviewed articles. Those are sharp and concise and precise and without fluff. And so moving from that to a memoir is something that took a while. It took me two and a half years, that whole process of writing, of rewriting, of um, editing and more editing, of deciding which stories to keep and which stories to um, toss. The two things, being a doctor and being, even if you write papers as an academic doctor, and being an author, writing a memoir, are vastly different. Uh, in addition to uh, your memoir and your Substack newsletter, you also have a blog on your uh, website. And what subject matter do you write about at your blog, and how does it differ, if it does so, from your uh, Substack newsletter? The blog is more in-depth uh, about topics that parents and mothers are interested in, child care, general pediatrics, issues about working mothers, burnout, jobs, um, having a career and a family, family values, things like that. The blog goes into way more depth and answers more questions. And I'm able to insert little bits of medical knowledge since I'm a pediatrician and I still have a pediatric license. I want to make sure parents get correct information. I don't want to just write about the things that I think they need to know, but I always echo recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so my blog goes into way more depth about topics, whether it's maternal issues or child issues or newborn issues or vaccinations or whatever. And my newsletter is shorter and more to the point with personal stories, I think those are the biggest differences. Uh, what was it like for you to practice medicine full time? And uh, as a neonatologist, I must imagine that must be a, a stressful, heart wrenching uh, mm -hmm. field of medicine while raising three children of your own. Well, um, I couldn't raise three kids without the help of my husband, who's also a physician. And my job was quite a bit more demanding than his. As a pediatric nephrologist, he didn't work in the hospital at night as much as I did as a neonatologist. So we were lucky enough to be able to afford to have a nanny, but only a nanny who came to our house during the day to look after kids or take kids to or from school if we were both working. My husband and I were partners in taking care of our children. And when I was on call in the hospital at night, he did everything that I usually did. Bedtime routines, bath, books, etc. We shared our ability to rush home during the day and look after sick kids or take a sick child to the pediatrician. Lots of parents have an issue with this because if a kid gets sick at school or during daycare, somebody has to come get them and somebody has to figure out how to take them to the doctor to figure out what they need and if they need medication. That was hard to do. And if my husband had not had a job that was a bit easier than mine, we would have struggled more with that. Now, the NICU work was amazingly rewarding. I, it's critical care, and I love the ICU, but it's also mothers and babies. And I loved 
attending a delivery of a mom who was going to have a child with a birth defect or an extremely premature baby. I loved being able to talk to her and her husband before the delivery when there was time. And after the delivery, after the baby was settled in and stabilized on a ventilator, on a radiant warmer with all the lines and tubes and medications going, I liked being an advocate for the parents in a way that I told the truth to them about their baby's chances and about how therapy would or would not help their baby. And so as, a, as an extremely honest physician, I always told parents what they could expect. I talked to parents the way I would want to be talked to as a parent. But I love doing medicine in the NICU. It's lines and tubes and medicines and resuscitations and emergencies and, and high-risk deliveries, and it's fun. It's exciting. Um, it's also stressful. Sometimes the noise overload is a problem. Sometimes the line of people waiting to ask you questions is too long. Sometimes the outcome of a particular baby is not what we hoped. And I had to help parents deal with that. But on, on balance, there was way more good happening in the NICU than there was bad. More, far more babies survived and thrived and grew and went home than floundered or um, struggled and died. That's not to say that we had no deaths. I mean, anytime you're in an ICU, you're going to lose patients. But I couldn't have kept doing it if the majority of the patients had bad outcomes. The reason we do it is because a two-pound baby who's born 12 or 14 weeks early is a potentially normal child. And so helping parents to know that, to see that, to get through that, to recognize that they have the strength in their marriage to go through that together was terribly fulfilling. I loved my time in the NICU because I got to interact on a very intimate level with people who were in the middle of a stressful, traumatic episode in their lives, who were worried about their children, and I felt extremely helpful and caring. So yes, the NICU is stressful. Yes, it's hard. Yes, there are poor outcomes. But for the most part, it's a place where children respond to treatment, grow, thrive, and go home. What was it like for you to experience burnout? Because uh, because burnout is something that uh, uh, us authors uh, uh, tend to be more at ease of talking about than people in a lot of other uh, professions. And how did you recover? My burnout came late in my career. I was always pretty good about scheduling exercise and support with friends and my husband and I talked through lots of issues night after night. So my burnout did not happen until I was 62 years old. And I walked around the unit noticing that I didn't want to talk to the parents. I didn't want to talk to the nurses. I wanted to sort of be on my own, hide in the call room, so to speak. I was physically exhausted. I took a lot of night call. We always do. And even when I would sleep the next day, I woke up feeling physically exhausted. I noticed I was emotionally overwhelmed. I felt like things were closing in on me. And when you notice physical exhaustion as a physician, you know you need to rest. 
that's just part of being a doctor and being up at night and being on call. But emotional exhaustion is different. That's something that chronic stress causes, especially when cases are the most troublesome. And so I noticed that I was beginning to dissociate myself from some of those most problematic cases. For example, a baby born with a birth defect called a cloacal extrophy where her urethra and her vagina and her rectum all come out together as one big hole on the lower part of her abdomen. She had no separate out um, she had no separate openings for those three things, bladder, vagina, and colon. That's a terrible, terrible birth defect. And I took care in those last years of a baby who had that birth defect and the surgeons palliated her and fixed her some urethral openings to the side of her abdomen and fixed her a colostomy bag for stool to come out. And closed up the cloacal extrophy, but we knew that her kidneys were very damaged and damaged as part of the birth defect. And she had to have kidney dialysis, peritoneal dialysis for months and months in the NICU. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was a baby that was never ever going to survive to be normal. Yet her mother and father and some of the doctors wanted to keep her on dialysis because she was a real cute baby and everybody loved her and everybody loved her parents and especially her mom. And mostly they loved the baby. She was very cute and responsive. The nurses would bring in clothes for her and decorate her room. This particular baby stayed in the NICU for 12 months. She was transferred then to the pediatric ICU, continued on peritoneal dialysis until finally she went home on peritoneal dialysis and she died there a couple of weeks later. We all knew she was going to die. We all knew that she would never make it. Um, and I was really bothered about the futility of all those 18 months of treatment that she had been given. To keep her comfortable, yes, and because we loved her, yes, but was that the right thing to do? Um, was it really just because you can have a treatment in medicine, does that mean you should? There were some other cases like that, not quite as um, flagrant as that particular case with that severe birth defect. Tiny, tiny preemies. Uh, a baby born at 24 weeks gestation weighing less than a pound who had severe hemorrhages in its brain and which destroyed most of the brain and then developed meningitis, which destroyed what tissue was left in the brain. And the parents wanted everything done. And a case like that in which there is literally no hope of any normal existence for that child. Nothing. He won't see, he won't hear, he won't speak, he won't suck from a bottle. He will just be. Maybe seizures, maybe cerebral palsy. And the family wanted everything done, which we did. And that baby went home about seven months after he was born and during the first two years of his life, did exactly what we predicted, which was nothing. No recognition of other people, no eating, no speech, no hearing, no vision. And so cases like those two and a few others were bothering me. So I was tired. I was overwhelmed emotionally. I began to dissociate myself from my work and from patients. And finally, I felt like I wasn't making any difference. Those are the three main parts of burnout in medicine. You're exhausted and overwhelmed. 
You don't want to be around your patients, their parents, the nurses, where you work, and you feel like you're no longer making a difference. That's the ultimate feeling of burnout. Physicians love to do what they do. They feel very fulfilled by caring for patients. So when you finally reach the point where you are no longer effective, it is the rock bottom for physicians. And I reached that point when I was 62 years old. Luckily, I worked for a group that had a low risk nursery unit that needed to be covered. And I volunteered to go work there for a couple of years. Low risk babies, normal newborns, happy stories, uh, normal deliveries. Uh, got to talk to moms about breastfeeding and safe sleep and saw siblings visiting and grandparents happily around. And it was just a lovely time with me out of the ICU, away from that stress of those patients. I saw a psychiatrist to help me sort through my issues. I started exercising regularly. I um, had lunches and coffee with friends and we told stories and we laughed. Most of my friends are nurse practitioners and other doctors. So our stories are always about patients and parents. And we would remember and laugh and have a good time. I began to journal about my feelings. And um, that's when I first got the idea of writing about the NICU. But I knew that I was too burned out to start it at that time. So what I did to recover, took about a year to recover, was talk with a psychiatrist, exercise regularly, meet with friends, visit, laugh, tell stories, um, journal, um, get more sleep than I ever had before, and um, talk to my husband and let him sort of be a sounding board for me. That recovery was uh, really effective. I turned myself around within a year and would have been happy to go back to the NICU, but by then I felt at age 64, I really should go on and retire. I can tell you today at age 72 that I wished I had gone back because Retirement is very boring compared to medical practice. <laughs> so I miss it a great deal. Uh, I, I only have a few minutes left, but uh, one final question for this interview. What advice would you give to young working mothers uh, today? They need to talk about how they're feeling with their peers, whether it's other working mothers at work whether it is their best friends or a neighbor, somebody who's living the kind of life they're living, they all feel the same way. They all feel pressure to be a perfect parent, perfect mother, which is impossible, and also to do a good job at their jobs. 80% of women are now working for a living. Many of them have to work, but for the ones who enjoy working, like I did, the ones who get fulfilled by having a job, burnout really feels bad if you think you're not doing a good job. And burnout feels bad if you think you're not a good mother or you're having a lot of trouble with a particular child. So talking to other mothers who are going through the same thing is crucial. It is very important for women to not feel isolated and alone. Reading about burnout, especially reading my newsletter and my blog about burnout would be very helpful. Um, talking to people who've been through it and have been been through it enough to recover and get to the other side. There's 
easy advice is start exercising and keep a journal and get more sleep and talk to your husband and go on date nights and do all the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. Those things are more difficult to do. And moms who are really busy with children and work have to figure out how to schedule those to give themselves the care they need. But mainly working moms need to talk to other moms, learn how to set boundaries, not do everything. Working mothers try to do everything. That's impossible. And they need to recognize that what they're doing is very difficult and ask for help more than they are currently asking. They need to ask their spouse to help, ask their family to help, um, find out how to share babysitters, things like that. There are lots of little things that working moms can do, but if they feel alone and isolated, they don't think of them. Dr. Landers, thank you for appearing on Apollo Papyrus, and you were an amazing guest. Thank you. I appreciate that. Susan was an amazing guest, and if you or someone you know has given birth to a child prematurely and or has struggled maintaining a work-life balance, I recommend reading her book. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write and read your passion. Bye for now. Remember to subscribe to the Apollo Papyrus YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash at Apollo Papyrus and the Apollo Papyrus Substack newsletter at apollopapyrus.substack.com. Y'all can visit the Apollo Papyrus website at camparinapollo.witsite.com forward slash Apollo Papyrus and follow Apollo Papyrus on threads, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at Apollo Papyrus. Copy Copyright 2024, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.